yet today. And that is, so we've talked a lot about um, Martin's work and we'll talk a little bit about it some more today. Um, but the what, as impressive as the what is, um, Nicola and Jeremy kind of underscore the question of, well, why did Martin go down this road in academia? Um, and why is Martin so uh, connected to um, finding the truth? And she makes the point in one of her emails that really the why behind so much of Martin's work is a real, really strong um, inborn commitment to social justice. Um, she says, what has always struck me about Martin is his powerful sense of justice and huge courage in pursuing it. And she gives several examples um, of you know, Jeremy and um, Nicolae have known you for a very long time since you were students together uh, back in Maritzburg. Um, and she talks about your involvement in student journalism, uh, working at Knox in the early 80s, uh, which I think is the oldest student uh, newspaper in the country. Um, she talks about your political activism, your youth activism, your leadership roles in the UDF in the mid to late 1980s, which I think in your inaugural, which Mari told me to go back and read, uh, you talk about as sort of the bad old days in, in Maritzburg. Um, and your commitment to social justice at that point kind of um, manifested in, uh, not quite yet, manifested in uh, you being a political fugitive for some years and landing up in, in detention um, in, in Peter Maritzburg. And that commitment that was exhibited as a, as a young student political activist is something that she underscores as uh, such an important driver of your passion for doing work about uncovering the truth. Um, and so I wanted to kind of highlight that because there are a lot of young people here who might not know that part of Martin's background. Um, and I think it's important for, for understanding why you do what you do. Um, so, you know, from the sort of mid 1980s uh, in Maritzburg and, and spending time at the University of Natal in the, in the bad old days, um, you've kind of spent for your whole life in academia, <laughs> um, moving from Maritzburg to Johannesburg uh, at Wits in the 1990s. And I think Susie or Martine was talking about you being thrown in the deep end into economics, like Charles Simpkins having you teach like this insane number of new classes in the same year. Moving from Joburg and Wits to Cape Town via Princeton for a year um, and joining UCT at the time when the economics department at UCT is really kind of taking off and getting momentum as kind of the, the leader and economics training in, in the country to the ninth, to the 2010s when you're honing your econometrics machine um, and making all of us terrified <laughs> um, by, by you know your your um, very clear and very important training spending some time at Yale and taking over the helmet data first and, and moving data first really into the future um, and in the 2020s just continuing to pound that you know the 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 wisdom through your econometrics classes for uh for the graduate students um you spent your entire career in academia and we are certainly the beneficiaries uh, of that um, of that time and expertise um so i'm going to hand over to jesse now um and he can talk a little bit about uh Oh, well, you've got to you've got you to describe the methodology. So yeah, you I, have to. Okay. <laughs> so um, I didn't do this, but uh, authoritative sources tell me that uh, the corpus of Martin's work was fed into chat a chat GPT, or like a word cloud generator, yeah. and this is the result. Yeah, yeah. So this is a this tells us, you know, <laughs> at least ex post, what's important to Martin, or what has been important to Martin in in, in what he writes about. Oh, uh, it's not on there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, but, but Martin to uh, to reference the ghost workers paper. That's the dog that didn't bark. You'll see it's the absence of bullshit from the slide. That, uh, it's, that's that's a note, right? Um, so you know, intra household distribution, something that I uh, something that I myself would sort of <laughs> Martin was the first one who got me interested in this stuff. I think he, Martin was the first person who ever told me about Gary Decker's work, um, which has been important for me. Um, 
you know, that's something he's worked on a lot about. He talked a bit about this stuff about households and 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 what happens inside them. Um, obviously, uh, you know, reweighting. We talked and Murray talked a lot about the stuff about um, where's the assets? The assets are got to be here somewhere. Yeah, proxies, right? Survey data, markets, um, with some more recent stuff on electricity as well. Uh, data is surprisingly small. Um, go to the next slide. The employment, but obviously that picture that we were just looked at was totally dominated by South Africa, which is sort of like okay, sure. Um, but so let's let's remove that, and then we can get a bit of a, a clearer. Let's remove that outlier, and we can get a clearer picture of what's what Martin's been thinking about for, for, for his four decades. Um, and yeah, like, well, I guess I just told that. So I jumped ahead of myself. So that's what we've been, that's that's what we see has has mattered. Inequality is a big one. Um, you know, rural urban differences as well. Um, so for my, I, I, was, I was contracted to speak about the household stuff since that's stuff that I know a little about. Um, so something that, that you, you know, learn because Martin's a, a thoughtful person, right? You think about these things like, well, okay, so what are households, right? Like it's easy to turn that word around. What are they, uh, what do we think about them as economists? Well, they're important sites of consumption, right? People share food, they share transportation, they share housing itself. Um, but they're also sites importantly of, of human capital investment, you know, health, education, um, sort of non-cognitive skills passing on people's values and preferences, things like that that can be quite important for success in the labor market. Um, but you know, there you don't you don't live with the same set of people uh, throughout your whole life. People move in and out, and typically they have good reasons to do so. For some questions, this creates sort of an endogeneity problem, uh, and then I think it's fair to say that that's not. I don't think the professions come up with like a really good solution to this problem besides ignoring it. Um, and that's sort of bad. Uh, you know, it has implications for how you measure inequality, right? So like the sort of, the kind of plug and chug solution is to do something like some equivalent scale. But uh, if you really think about the economics of that, it's like maybe you should feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, that's obviously very important to think about migration decisions, something a point Jacob Vincent was aware of in that all the way back in 1978. Um, and it's it's very important for thinking about labor supply, who you live with, and your 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 household and family situation can be quite important for how you spend your time, i.e., labor supply. Um, what Martin's done a, a lot of stuff in this in related to these these topics. So one prong of his work in this area is being uh, with Mark uh, and other co-authors, a, a very in-depth analysis of the Agincourt data and, and other demographic surveillance systems, looking at um, changes in who stays with who and what resources do they share and what can affect the incentives to cohabit with other people. Um, he's done a bunch of stuff with former students, uh, Amy Thornton and Nicola Branson, uh, particularly about changes in the aggregate distribution of household size. Um, and I remember when I was, uh, when I was Martin's student as a master's student, he was supervising uh, Grace uh, Kumchelezi and, and Miracle Benhura, uh, working on topics like, uh, you know, changes in, in marriage rates and, uh, and participation in uh, how merit, how how labor force participation would vary with marital status. It's kind of like you know, kitchen table issues, which to me at the time I didn't quite understand were part of economics. But I came to realize that you could actually use economics to study these sort of very deep social questions. Uh, something that I still find very, uh, very interesting and, and fascinating to study. So that's. Uh, Martin's contributed a lot, especially to our knowledge of those topics in the in the local context, and I'm, I'm very grateful for him to introducing me and many other students to those those ideas. All right, Andrew Andrew's up to talk about measurement. Great. Okay. Um, so I worked with Martin for a while on data first, and I got to see this uh, area of his research. 
He's done a huge amount of work uh, on weights in various different ways, uh, working with Stats South Africa, as you heard from uh, Neil Rue uh, earlier, um, on proving, uh, figuring out difficulties with, uh, with the weights in the general household survey. He was very important uh, in figuring out, uh, thanks, Alison. Figuring out uh, Ned's weight, so he was crucially involved in setting up uh, and, and working out the, the weights for Ned's um, in, I think, all the different waves and helps myself and Kelly and Rudolf uh, figure out difficult parts of weights for Ned's cram. So that's been you know, a really crucial bit of contribution to data production. Uh, we talked a lot about the stats say data, but uh, within Feldrew um, uh, and Ned's, uh, Martin did, did a lot of work in data production. And then he's done a huge amount of work, as everyone's been talking about, uh, data quality issues in the DSS, comparing the survey data, comparing tax and survey data, and the ghost workers in the 1996 manufacturing sensor from the OHS has already mentioned more times than I expected today. Cool. <laughs> and, uh, glad we are all remembering that paper of Martin's. Uh, and counted, I think, exactly once. <laughs> <laughs> and five times per day. <laughs> Verbal citations don't count. <laughs> um, and then, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, really important work uh, harmonizing earnings uh, across the bunch of surveys. If you have any free time, you can download the do files from Palms uh, in, in Palms on the Data for its website. And there's hundreds of lines of complicated code yeah. that Martin wrote. Uh, to make sure, it's particularly in the OHS, as we think we're bouncing around all the time, differences in dramatic differences across how the, the questions were asked in those surveys. And Martin did all the, the difficult work in, in putting those together. And that resulted, in, I think, are very important papers in describing changes in inequality over the long period in South Africa. People hadn't really done systematically, there were bits and pieces of things. Um, but, but Martin, I think really showed us what was needed to, to put that, uh, to, to answer that question. And that ended up as a public good, as well as Martin's papers, ended up as a public good uh, in the past data sets. And yeah, if you don't get these things right, then it's hard to answer a whole lot of other questions. So um, yeah, this getting to the truth of, um, is crucial in, in, in Martin's work. Thanks. Okay, uh, Tang, we'll need to continue, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a word cloud for Martin's students. Uh, having uh, we did uh, Martin, and now we've got all the uh, that's because the PhD students. PhD yeah, students. Uh, and you can. I don't know how many things appear here that don't appear in the other. Malawi maybe, um, yeah. but other than that, I don't know. It looks looks pretty similar to me. So kind of cool that yeah, Martin's students for the most part have followed in, in his uh, area of expertise. Thanks, Stephanie. Drinking them with your results. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, GPT um, thinks that Martin's next uh, thesis uh, that he's going to supervise is drum roll uh, economics empowerment from Jenkins <laughs> South Africa and Malawi. <laughs> So because Martin has so many fantastic ideas and because he's also very busy teaching and he's very busy advising, I think he currently has six PhD students that he's advising. And he's also very busy running data first along with Alison, Celia and, and Lynn Wolfrey. Um, and uh, formerly Andrew as well, uh, sometimes the finishing doesn't always get done. And that's an understatement. this is something that I've also picked up a little bit from you. So I thought, well, ChatGPT was so useful with the PhD thesis that maybe we could just ask ChatGPT, which is the next paper on your list of uh, working papers that you should work on to finish. And um, so we did that and we plugged that all in. Uh, and the chat you can say thanks for giving me the list of unpublished papers. Uh, it's important to consider factors like the relevance of the research, the potential impact, current <laughs> academic and research landscape, <laughs> very polite. Yes. <laughs> thanks to the information provided, one paper that stands out for its potential relevance and timeliness is thank you, Kevin, investigating inequality trends in Africa, uh, research and WIIP with Murray. 
Is this um, is this a real paper that exists? Or was this, was that the, exists. Yeah, no, we've we fed in the current list of Martin's working papers and said which one should he be working on. <laughs> and so ChatGPT Chat GPT actually gave us like ter terrifyingly, you know, potentially useful information. It says this paper aligns with contemporary discussions about inequality. Timely research topics. Additionally, collaborating with Murray Labour and the well-known <laughs> economist. <laughs> and moreover, I then ChatGPT actually also gave us a list of journals that you could send it to. So we should submit it. Some potential journal options include World Development, Journal of Economic Inequality, Journal of Development Economics, and gave like reasons for why this paper would have fit this. And so this seems like a really reasonable, useful set of assumptions, and like I probably will use this. <laughs> Possibly not, but what it what it told me was that you know ChatGPT is potentially full of BS, but also is a very um, very likely to know how to play the academic game, you know, well if you want to play that game. But here's the thing about Martin, and one of the things that I love most about him is that he doesn't play the academic game mm -hmm. because it's not a game. It's a, it goes back to the commitment to finding the truth. And so for better or worse, I think for better, Martin is a seeker of truth and knowledge. And he's also a provider of public goods in that role as a truth seeker. He doesn't do, as so many do, just play the academic game. In yeah. terms of his uh, provider of public goods, uh, go back one second. Um, so we've talked a little bit about data first today. I, I probably most of you know Martin's um, going to pass on the leadership of uh, Data First uh, at the end of the year, um, and you can go on the Data First website. We kind of we, we all know what Data First does. There's a very clear kind of dry description of what Data First does, um, and I think it's a very understated description of the role that Data First plays in social science in South Africa. Um, it's a very unglamorous description relative to its importance, I think, in, in the new South Africa. I actually myself came of age at the advent of democracy, and I really remember going to school at Rhodes in the mid-90s and feeling completely lied to about um, all, you know, by all the adults around me about the history that um, was part of my country um, and taking classes in political science and really for the first time learning about what it was to be um, in South Africa. And an important part of my learning in my economics classes, including economics up at BITS, was based on data that was only being collected and brought to light during this time in the late 1990s. So I'm talking specifically about the PSLSD. Martin writes very eloquently in his inaugural lecture about the role of data and the importance of the PSLSD in the early 1990s. And you get the sense that this particular um, data set heralded like a new enlightenment for a generation that had been kept in the dark, for generations that had been kept in the dark for so very long. And I think through his work in Data First, Martin continues to shine a light on reality in his role bringing data to policymakers, academics, the rest of South Africa and the world in a very usable and very timely fashion. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Martin, the teacher, advisor and mentor. So we have up here um, a list of Martin's completed PhD students. Um, we look forward to the others who are going to join us soon um, or jo join this group. And then in addition to uh, all of these PhD students, Martin has also supervised 17 master's theses, including my own and Jesse's, Nicholas, um, uh, Greg Lewis. Lewis. Yeah? He supervises honors. He actually left Okay, maybe I... Went straight from honors to... Okay. Michigan. Measurement error, sorry. <laughs> but I think what's what's important to sort of notice here is that Martin's students have kind of gone into academia and to policy in, in important positions, and I think that influence is is really just going to to grow and continue. Um, uh, Catherine, um, I'm going to ask Je um, Andrew to talk a little bit about the PG Dip. Sure. Um, Okay, um, so Francis Wilson um, and Stat South Africa, the former SG, um, somehow agreed uh, to funding a training program for Stat South Africa. One of the goals was they wanted people to fail or potentially fail. They didn't want some easy option. They wanted a serious training program that 
the employees from Stat South Africa would really have to work hard at. Um, I don't, I don't know, maybe one person out of the 50 uh, who came uh, didn't pass, but it was a really rigorous, uh, careful training program that was in the end designed and developed pretty much by Martin. Um, and he did that kind of extra, extra work. I mean, you've all heard the other extra work that Martin's done. This was extra, extra work. Um, that program was yeah put through, um, you know, I remember going with Martin to talk to the stats department and make sure that they were on site and didn't mind us doing a program that was kind of a little bit stats, but mostly economics. Um, and Martin kind of shepherded that through uh, the program as basically extra work for, um, for, for the university. It was good for the department, but obviously it was good for, for Martin. He thought that this was something super important. Um, and in the end, the, the program isn't running anymore. It's uh, ran out of funding. Uh, Stats South Africa ran out of funding. Um, 60 students graduated with this postgrad diploma. Um, 50 of them, I think, were from Stats South Africa. We had a few others that was open to anyone. Uh, but I think that really was a, a big uh, contribution. Those people are, as, as others have mentioned earlier on, now, still in Stats South Africa and, and in other places. And there were a huge number of people who attended these, uh, the short courses that uh, they had first put on kind of at the same time as, as the postgrad diploma. <laughs> In addition to all my, uh, Martin's other work in teaching, um, he taught on consumption and micro theory, complex surveys, and, and measuring economic welfare, and was responsible for the designing of many of those courses uh, and setting them up. And, and sometimes he exited, and other people took on and sort of taught the things that he'd prepared uh, and envisioned. So, yeah, this I think is one of Martin's crucial uh, pieces of, of work that he's done over the last, uh, in the last decade. Um, yeah, I think it's it, it was it was a really good program, and the training is continuing in different ways as short courses, uh, even though the diploma is um, itself not running anymore. And yeah, I think this is something that uh, I'm uh, can be really proud of, and I think we should all be amazed uh, at, at the work that he did for this program. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. So um, we asked. Uh, all of as many of Martin's former grad students as possible. What it's like to work with Martin because Martin. The thing with Martin is when you, when you work with him, he continues to mentor you, and in many cases becomes a collaborator over time. So we ask people what it give us a few lines on what it's like to work with Martin, <laughs> and and the answers were remarkably correlated. Uh, so we have garbage in, garbage out, um, descriptives, descriptives, descriptives in capital letters. Uh, we already heard this today. Do not conflate fancy methods with correct empirics. That makes no sense. <laughs> and then varieties of that makes no sense. It's not clear to me that, or it's not <laughs> obvious to me that, um, and then there were a few more, um, like frankly, this is bullshit. <laughs> That's a good one. I don't expect you to beat the data until it confesses, uh, but what's the story? Um, one of my favorites was, this was from I, I look, there's no money in theory. <laughs> um, and bloody everything, bloody amazing, bloody ridiculous, bloody bizarre, bloody boring, bloody mind boggling. Uh, so I think we can, you know, most of us relate to, to these um, comments. Um, I think more, uh, more seriously, um, I think Reza uh, wrote this comment, being precise all the way through to the end having the humility, patience, and tenacity to attend to any mistakes in the original and subsequent drafts and faithfully describing what it is you're actually doing and finding versus what you think you may be doing and finding. <laughs> uh, that, that's something that Riz and, and many of us have taken away uh, from working with you, thanks. Um, and so just to, uh, just to kind of end um, on the next slide or two, um, looking ahead, Martin's uh, inaugural speech that I think came out as a Seldry working paper in 2017, you make this uh, really um, you know, important statement, inequality will be broken only if the next generation is better taught. Um, and so I wanted to end with um, just you know, emphasizing for you, Catherine, if I can have the last slide, you have had a key role in ensuring that that happens, that all of us are better taught. Um, we appreciate you, we love you, and we treasure, treasure you in the perspectives on social science that you've given us. 
um, and that will continue to guide us in all of our work. Thanks. Cheers. Uh, that's all we have, folks. <laughs> um, yeah. So, thank you, Allison. Um, I think if Mark, if you'd uh, like to say something, if anyone else uh, has things they'd like I to do add, think now's a good time. Fun. I do think Mark is going to respond, and I think he has to. <laughs> I just want to give him two minutes to gather his thoughts. But um, Martin, I can't let the opportunity pass just to thank you from my side as well. But I think I want to say from myself, but also from the point of view, you see, I'm, many here don't know me. My name is Mark Collinson, and I'm in the discipline of public health, but I started in medicine. Then I go into um, uh, uh, epidemiology, which now becomes data, and then I get into public health. And then we started to work on, because of the kinds of questions in public health around hospital delivery, clinic services, we need to know about the population. But so longitudinal data sets, we've heard a bit today about Agincourt. So Martin, uh, I've been bringing social science thinking uh, into the epidemiology that we've done uh, from Witzen and other parts of the continent. But sure, I learned so much from you when we were at Princeton, uh, one floor down from, Ang from Angus and Anne. And uh, I was there to study migration, actually. But uh, we had this longitudinal data Martin, I don't quite know what first made us gel. I think the social justice part was important for us both early. And also, I think the, the love of the data, the mathematics, but then this public good part of it that kept coming up in our work always and, and keeps coming. But I didn't know then how to analyze the data that we had. I didn't know what a treasure we had. So we sat there and then you showed us this treasure. But I just want to reflect back on one thing we were doing because it was very amazing for me. And who was it? David mentioned the kinds of complexities of relationships. So I can't remember exactly if it was David, but that sit in a household, mm -hmm. right? And so you have so many, and it is you actually, mm -hmm. sorry, David. So there's all of these households. This is what we were doing at Princeton because in Agricourt, we had this curious way of saying, now, how do we know who's related to who? So we started off with the spurious anchor of the head of the household, but then we relate back. So the wife of the head, the daughter of the head, or, and then these strings start getting longer. So you get the wife, of the sister of the thing of the head. So just like Anne was saying, right? <laughs> so we've got all of this. And then Martin just showed me how to start unraveling and how to categorize. And so in the end, I learned the data code, the algorithms, but actually the approach is what I got the most out of that. So since then, we've been able to eject some of that into longitudinal data um, for social science purposes. And now all of the longitudinal data platforms that I'm sort of part of now have a healthy social science dimension with getting social science in as best we can. And as you know, Cape Town will soon have a, 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 an HDSS there of their own. So I just want to say thank you. Steve and Kathy wanted to say thank you. Uh, they wrote to me this morning to convey that, who are the leaders of Adjun Court, also very public-minded uh, people. So. Uh, we love you very much too, and I've loved today. Today's been great. This very building for me has taught me what I needed uh, to help go back into health faculty and think more about the social science dimensions, which of course are so critical because the heartbeat uh, is so influenced by your social setting. So thank you so much, Martin. Really personal thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I need a right of reply to uh, Taryn. So, um, yeah, I don't don't want to make this thing too long because it's uh, no bullshit kind of like, so. But I mean, one of the things that it's actually been amazing is like, uh, the thing that keeps you going in academia is the fact that over the years I've actually worked with some incredible people you know it's kind of like it's uh so 
but what makes us do the things we do? I mean, so to some extent, I mean, I come from a Lutheran background and like, you know, so it's, you know, kind of you do the right thing because it's the right thing, uh, you know, even if it's not the popular thing at the time. So a very strong uh, set of um, teachings from my parents way back, uh, back in the bad old days. Um, but yeah, so there's so there, there's there's a set of things that drive you that basically you know there's a right way of doing it and then there's an easy way and a corrupt way of doing things you know that's kind of like really what you you, sh you shouldn't be doing, but that's not sufficient you know so actually so somewhere along the line what you also need to do is run into people where basically you kind of feel well actually it's been worth it you know kind of like you know if you just kind of like doing this thing, slogging on the side, and, you know, you, you see nobody's responding to that, that's very depressing, and you go and you you want to do something else. So, so over the years, I've been very lucky um, with uh, finding some amazing people to work with. Um, none so more than amazing than Taryn. So, um, Taryn, I met back you know, in the late 90s at WITS. So, uh, she came uh, to yeah, uh, you know, learn economics, whatever, because uh, Judy Street at Rose had said, you know, if you want to do this stuff, go to Wits. Um, um, and um, yeah, and then basically uh, we we ran into Anne and Angus, and that basically I think was a big uh, big influence in uh, in, in both of our lives. So I'm. Already said early on, like you know, and you've had a massive impact on uh, on me and on a, a range of other South African academics, uh, and uh, both through your writing and 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 directly. And then you kind of like you know you see, you you get inspired that actually yeah this is actually worth it we're finding things. Um, but then over the years, you know, I've had many other exceptional students, and uh, I'm amazed how many of them are. Uh, are here. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to single out only Jesse because he was on the organizing uh, committee. So uh, Jesse, it was a pleasure to work with you. Um, and um, you also learn from your students. You know, there's things that Jesse can do now that I never would be able to do in a zillion years. That's good. That's actually why we uh, why we do that. And then through the work with Data First, uh, I was privileged enough to uh, get colleagues like uh, Andrew and Alison, uh, and uh, and they've kept me going you know, through some uh, not so easy times. Yeah. So the last thing I want to say is that this thing was organized in secret, you know. So basically, I actually knew very little about anything. So, so the only thing that um, that I knew was the date. So Taryn did run this past me because she wanted to make sure that I didn't suddenly leave town when I heard there was something <laughs> that was going to happen here. Um, so she wanted me to keep the uh, uh, the date uh, open. Um, and then, yeah. So she said, like, you know. She's not going to tell me what they're going to do, but like, you know, so I said, there's enough bullshit in the world already. I don't want this event to add to the stock of bullshit that is out there, kind of like, you know. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm not going to comment on whether it has or hasn't. <laughs> um, but the moment that the news came out that this thing was happening, uh, I did get a couple of, you know, so leaks panicked calls from the likes of Hobbit, kind of like um, from the World Bank, kind of saying, you know, does this mean that I'm like, you know, about to die or about to retire from uh, from UCT? So, yeah, so I, I forget who it was who said, you know, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> kind of like, uh, I'm not dead yet. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's not a secret that my health is, um, yeah, it's in the way down. So, uh, so I did ask for uh, the university to find um, a new director for Data First. Uh, 
I asked that 18 months ago, but in two university style, <laughs> they, I don't think they have found one yet, or at least if they've found one yet, they haven't told me. Kind of okay. like, um, so um, I know they've been trying to put pressure on Andrew on the side, but um, um, but yeah, I mean, I basically am not involved in that process, so I don't know where, where, it's, uh, where it's gone to, but uh, I have resigned, so if they haven't found a director by the end of December, that's not good news for data first. So, uh, so uh, unfortunately, the other thing that I have discovered over time is that, you know, doing good work is not always a guarantee that, you know, the powers that be will acknowledge that it's good work or that they need to fund it or make it continue to go. So, uh, so that is one of the things that I guess I leave data first still with a little bit of residual anger at the way in which, I mean, not just the uh, way the university treats data first, which I mean, I can't really complain about, but I mean, the government treats statistics South Africa, you know, they cut the budget so that basically you can't do decent social science. Uh, and then surprise when the census doesn't you know, hit the targets, you know. So, so there's all these things where basically you think, you know, I, I could have told you that beforehand, you know, that actually if you want quality information, you want quality students, it actually costs money, you know, and it actually costs time. Somebody has to do that. Um, and um, yeah, but I mean, Money is not the only criterion why we do what we do. So I do think it's important to to remind ourselves, you know, that even if you know that may not be immediately recognised, that actually it's worth doing it. And I, I hope that that's a set of uh, lessons that at least my students uh, will uh, will take uh, take with them. And yeah, I'm deeply indebted to everyone who's shown up here. Uh, I have made some thank you cards because I didn't know who was going to show up. It was a complete <laughs> surprise. So there was some people I knew. I, I didn't actually kind of address them because I, I, I beforehand, but uh, I will give you uh, a thank you card. Um, um, uh, these are photos that I took myself. So that's kind of like my hobby to keep me sane on the side while I'm not, you know, fighting with the data, which is typically is too depressing for words, but well, that is how it is, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks. So now <laughs> Eating and drinking and having fun. Quickly say something. So I should introduce Cam. Cam is the person in this room that I know. Actually, I know my sister Inga the longest. <laughs> I am, but of my non-family um, uh, members. Cam is the person I know longest. Um, he was with me in Peter Maritzburg in the bad old days. And the one thing which I also didn't mention, but I should have mentioned, is that when you get depressed about South Africa right now, kind of like with a lot of things to get depressed about South Africa right now, you know, if you've been through the 1980s, you kind of know, well, Things aren't actually quite as bad now as uh, as uh, as you might think. That actually, back in the 1980s, if you'd said this is what South Africa is going to look like in 2023, we would have thought, well, that actually looks pretty good, you know, kind of compared to where we where we were. You know, so that also gives you a lot of perspective. You know, when you see a lot of bullshit around you, that actually, well, maybe in the long run, you know, things do actually go in a more positive direction. Anyway, Cam uh, was uh, one of my mates back. We used to call them comrades. I don't want to use that word. It portrays my radical leftist roots. Uh, 
which you may not know existed, but yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, so 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 Cam and I went through some pretty tough patches back in the 1980s. Yeah. I want to start off by saying thank you very much, uh, Martin. And thanks to the organizers. And I've been moved by the fact that you've organized such a tribute to Martin and you know, outlined and exemplified the kind of work that he does. Plus, I think uh, showing some kind of uh, recognition of the work that he does as an educator and as a friend to all of you. You know, I, I've known Martin, and I think you've pointed out correctly from, you know, what Nick Lee says and uh, Jeremy says. Yeah, I met Martin in the 1980s, young student activist, very left-wing, uh, but it was a tough time, as he said. And, and being a white activist at that time meant that you'd been isolated from that very community. So that, you know, he eventually became the secretary of the UDF in Peter Maritzburg. And uh, his engagement, uh, well, I didn't know nothing about research then. I studied in pure science, went as a chemist, and suddenly my whole thinking started to change. And being involved as an activist, you start to think, hey, there's something missing. Because the moment you start talking to people like Martin and other fellow activists, they were talking about concepts I've never heard of and concepts that I didn't understand at all. So, yeah, we were talking about materialism, we were talking about growth and economics and, you know, distribution and inequities and so on. Never came across that. And I started to study economics. The first time I did some kind of analysis and I looked at this and I looked at the variance of real numbers. Couldn't understand that. Because in chemistry, it was always never real numbers. It was decimal fractions, you know, variance. Until someone like Martin comes and says, no, you're not dealing with molecules anymore. You're dealing with people who have a different personality. <laughs> and, you know, that's when I started to get used to social science in that sense. But uh, as an activist, I think Martin was incredibly resilient. I still think he still displays that level of resilience now in his academic work. And also it's the destiny of truth, the destiny of justice, the destiny of you know equality uh, and so on. All of those still resonate in everything that Martin does. And I like the, you know, those word frequency diagram that you showed, a lot of that's true of Martin. Uh, and, and his, I think, involvement in research. First, I couldn't understand what he studied. In his undergraduate work, he did, uh, you know, he, he was a very bright student in mathematics. But that I knew, and I wanted to meet him because I was in chemistry. There was a fellow colleague of mine doing law, and another one was doing physics, and so on. So he wanted to meet this young mathematician and understand who he was. And he didn't resemble anything of a mathematician. <laughs> Next thing he was doing philosophy. Then he ended up with the PhD in geography. So I just couldn't understand this guy. <laughs> Why all these different fields? And then suddenly an econometrist, you know? Uh, but in that period, uh, there was a time which as activists, we had to come up with arguments to argue against, you know, the apartheid state and give them real cogent arguments about inequities. And we had something in the 80s, which was a rent boycott and a rates boycott. And then Martin did some interesting work. So he used to work in an organization in a back room at uh, Peter Marsburg uh, University called DSRG, Development Studies Research Group, I think it is. Mm -hmm. So some interesting work and suddenly came back and I said, okay, what does this mean? So essentially he said, if you look at the way rates are distributed in terms of the Group Areas Act, you would find that in black communities and Indian colored communities, per square meter of land and per square meter of property, you're paying a higher rate value. Because values were high, the demand was higher in those areas and the supply was short. 
So suddenly I became really interested in this. We took this argument and we presented, so we went, we had a delegation after a long march, presented to the Peter Maritzburg Council then, and they were astounded by what we said. Thank you very much, we heard you. We'll give you a response in two weeks time. We still haven't got that response yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was a kind of introduction to, to research that Martin, you know, started to get within the activist community. And, you know, as that progressed, he did, did some remarkable work thereafter. And the other thing I, I didn't see mentioned here was some things that we still use today. That he did some interesting work with the, which was the Financial and Fiscal Commission and others when we were part of it. But essentially looking at how do we take national tax resources and a tax base and distribute that equally amongst all the different regions and areas. And suddenly we came up with a very good formula for provinces and local government around equitable share and the basis for which that takes place. And the two things that still apply today, one was when I was in the DRC and you know the basis for distributing resources was based on ethnicity. And yeah, we were trying to negotiate and say, no, you cannot do it with uh, you know ethnicity and ethnic bias. You need to do it in an objective way. Mm -hmm. And we spoke about the kind of equitable share that we use in South Africa, much of which can be credited to the work that Martin did and the formulas. We thought we were winning. At the end of the day, came back and said, thank you very much. That one work in the DRC. <laughs> we'll talk to you in another 10 years time. Uh, and sadly enough, I mean, that's the basis for wars in the DRC, which is based on, the, on this ethnicism. But the more recent sort of, uh, uh, the more recent work that we've been doing is I'm working on looking at putting together an infrastructure funding platform or financing platform. And part of which is to get the private sector to come on board. And we had a really nice, interesting workshop in Joburg and Cape Town about looking at uh, uh, looking at credit worthiness of subnational governments, municipalities and provinces and so on. And the questions that were part of the question we raised is A, how is this equitable share distributed? And I went through the formula with everybody, and these are all bankers and financiers. And then, uh, and what is its stability? In the formula itself, there's a stability factor mm -hmm. in it, so that it gives you some kind of stability and predictability over the long term. And this is what financiers want. Interestingly enough, they loved it. And, and today we actually have a model for credit worthiness based on that. And it, and it gave a lot of our financiers confidence in it. And I think we're able to, uh, we're doing work with about 50 municipalities at the moment on wastewater treatment plants. Mm -hmm. And actually we think we can fund the whole thing using this financial model. But a lot of it is underpinned by the kind of work that was done by the FFC, some of the formulas that Martin and initially developed and you know, changed over time, but it's still there. And the principles are still there and so on. So from a public policy perspective, I think the contribution that is made is greatly significant. But I think the most important thing is having a friend like Martin, is incredibly loyal, incredibly caring, right? and also a great dad. So Martin is a fantastic friend, a dad, and you know he's part of our family in essence. So myself and Cindy will tell you that, you know, whenever we we miss Martin, we'll call him or we'll go and see him and so on. It's possible, but he's a really great friend to have, wonderful photographer. He's starting to teach me about birds <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. Uh, and he has this really incredible knowledge, not just about economics. When you talk to him about physics or, you know, uh, subatomic particles or yeah. any of those. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very convincingly, you know. And uh, but the last person that you want to play a general knowledge quiz with is Martin. <laughs> uh, 
And you know, these little card games, uh, 30 seconds and so on. He crushes all of us. <laughs> I don't know if he's done that to you and Alice. Crosswords, crosswords yes, yeah. crosswords. We did one yesterday. Yeah. And basically, I was like, oh, I know this one. And one of the clues, megalithic two. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the, the, the variety of disciplines that he went through from, you know, philosophy, mathematics, geography, economics and econometrics now has given him, I think, that flair for general knowledge and this deep understanding of society in which you can very quickly, you know, discard the BS from everything else. And that is, that's the amazing talent that Martin has. But, but lastly, I want to say, Martin, thank you. And I think you're a really wonderful friend for all of, for all of us. You know? And I bring regards from Faisal, who's supposed to be a friend from Canada and other parts of the world, many of whom he grew up with in Peter Maritzburg, who are all fellow activists, who still phone me and ask me, how's Martin doing? And he's made an enormous contribution. And uh, during the 40th year of the UDF, people are talking about the contributions that he made in the Midlands area in Peter Marisburg. And at that time in the 1980s, when we were in prison, it was the most violent part of the country. And I think the most horrific things that have occurred, occurred during that time in this country. So going through all of that, I think, the contribution you made politically, academically, and as a family friend is invaluable to all of us. And I want to thank all of you for doing this and being present here and honoring this. Thanks very much. I'm not in charge yet. So... <laughs> Right, probably most of you don't know me. I'm Hermann Wittenberg and I'm Martin Cousins. And let me just take one minute just to say something about the early history. I know Martin probably longer than anybody in this room. Uh, I was born in 1961 and Martin one year later, so we're one year apart. And we both grew up in what was then called Natal, uh, Martin in Peter Maritzburg and I in Freyheit. And um, Martin, you probably know this, that um, growing up, there was always this continual rivalry between our respective mothers, Monica and my mother Gisela, comparing her first born <laughs> sons. And my mother would say, yes, Hermann has ridden the bicycle already and he can walk, he can run. And uh, Monica then counted with, with other achievements, which Martin, her, um, much loved son uh, managed. But Monica always had a trump card. Martin was clever. <laughs> Martin was the clever one. And my mother had tried to counter, and you know, there were these comparisons, and then you know, the school reports were compared closely and so on. But um, I'm afraid Monica won out at the end. <laughs> Straight A's in matric, and Martin won some fabulous bursary. I don't know what it was. Was it the Oppenheimer or the Rhodes or something? Anglo-American. Anglo and I won the Freyheit High School 300 Rand <laughs> bursary to help me with further studies. Uh, so Martin, I think uh, today, I think it's it's vindicated your mother's assessment of you. Uh, you are the clever one. <laughs> he's also full of bullshit. Uh, what he hasn't said, he's actually professor of English, kind of like so. I mean, yeah. Did okay. uh, <laughs> sorry? He did okay. He did okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so basically, it's an academic family. Kind of his father ended up as an academic. My father was an academic. My <laughs> uncle was an academic. It's kind of one of these things which 
we don't talk enough about like how some things actually do run in families and it's a set of you know what's important like you know so um in my case it was you know not you know that you actually go and become a doctor or a lawyer or or, or whatever to make money but um you know, pressure on our children careful yeah. you know? <laughs> No, but it's it's kind of like that. That we have the we have the um, the the privilege of actually doing stuff that we wanted to do. I think that's the important thing. You know, that comes with a middle class background. Um, uh, that actually, and that's not true of everyone. I mean, so first generation academics typically find life much tougher because you know you have to not just Prove yourself in academia. Uh, you can question yourself: Are you in the right place? Whatever, um, uh, which is something that you know I never questioned. You know, like, <laughs> I, I knew the university was like second home to me. Uh, uh, so yes, you, we have a lot of privileges which you know helped us get where we are. Uh, and um, but. You know, this this is something economists are not very good at measuring. And these other things that, that seem to 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 matter uh, for why people make the decisions that they do. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else want to say anything? I'm glad we didn't say this for Martin's funeral. Uh, I, I, I'll be very candid. I've been to more funerals and weddings. Sometimes they're immensely insightful. Sometimes they're recruitment drives. I prefer the insightful ones. Um, but we don't spend enough time recognizing the contributions people have made to our lives when they're available to hear it. So thanks to the organizers for creating this event. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks. Yeah, welcome to you. Um, I did have a, I did have a few things I wanted to say. Um, the first one, Andrew, I think you might have forgotten, but when you came back to South Africa, I think we were out. I don't know if it was in sort of Mowbray, yeah. Cactus, or something. Andrew was back in South Africa. He had at least two options in terms of where to go. From some reason, Catherine and I were both there. I already knew uh, Andrew from Oxford, and um, we won't say who the other option was. Um, uh, and a uh, notionally more high profile um, economist in South Africa, but he just says, Andy, what is it you want to do? And we explained it, he said, you got to go with Martin. Like, Martin is the best. <laughs> so, you know, and he did. And uh, I think I think the, the, the benefits um, are here to see for everyone. Um, the other thing I want to say, which I think has come out in some of the remarks made by um, other people earlier, but something um, very important about Martin, which I've always respected, is that. Um, he is very frank in his assessment of uh, of other people's work, and not everybody has always been happy about that. I've certainly come across people who grumbled about it and and, and so forth. Um, and sometimes people who didn't know Martin might have taken it the wrong way. But those of us who have known him know where that's coming from. Certainly, and you know, I mean, Martin supervised me for like six years, and of course, I went to many seminars where Martin was present and so forth. Um, and personally, I can't remember a single instance in which I felt that Martin was making a gratuitous criticism. It might have been, you know, some people might have interpreted it as harsh, but as others have said, it was it was about concern with the truth. Are you getting at what is correct? Are you representing things correctly? Um, and and I think that's something also that is a, is is still lacking um, in academia and in society more broadly, and it's something that's not being still not being dealt with in a mature way. So we have cultures of like gratuitous criticism and the response currently to, is to push back and say, well, don't, don't criticize at all. Just like, you know, go to somebody afterwards and just have a quiet word or something. But that's not consistent with the idea of pursuing the truth in the public term. Um, and I think in many ways, uh, even if um, sometimes you love people up the wrong way, but I think Martin has made a very important contribution in that respect. And I think if we had more people who were uh, as um, uh, skilled and insightful as Martin um, and willing to uh, speak up about these things and you know, rub some people up the wrong way, um, we might uh, have less bullshit 
in the public domain, um, public policy would be better. And I think um, I think the discipline of economics uh, in general, but let's say in South Africa in particular, um, would also be better. So I think that's also sort of something that I wanted to emphasize. I think it came out um, of, the, of the points earlier. I guess there are a few other things that I could have said, but um, let me stop there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, when I heard, and Alison, yeah, when I heard um, of this thing and the life, I must be very honest, I'm the guy just on the margin. I'm a musician, I don't know anything about the economy. <laughs> I don't really know what he's been doing, so it's a really very interesting thing to hear all of this. Sorry, Martin, I didn't even realize what, what <laughs> <laughs> So we're not talk by academics in that way. I'm a very much ground person working with the kids. But yeah, probably. <laughs> So I am also not an economist, but everything you have said today, I have seen growing up because when I was a child, I used to lie about facts to win arguments with my friends. And dad would say, Ali, that is not how facts work. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I would lie, make up facts. And then when I became a teenager, I learned the importance of saying fancy words that I heard from my dad like, Statistically significant. <laughs> but it sounded really smart. So I've won more arguments that way. And then I got to university and I decided I didn't want any truck with things that were factual or things that were true. And I said, I'm not going to do economics. I'm going to go the opposite direction and do a BA in philosophy. I was when he said, Oh, I started with a BA. <laughs> And now I finally think that I have come to the point where I realize everything you said today, he has slowly been teaching us when we've been growing up. Like things like, oh, where did you learn this fact? Like I would come home from school and be like, oh, dad, did you know this? And go, well, actually, I don't think that can be true. <laughs> Where's the data set for that? Where did you learn this? Because it's not a bad in source. So I think like it's made us all probably more aware of where our information comes from, even if we are not economics, economists ourselves. So thank you. And thank you for everyone who came up here. Oh, uh, I'll be very brief because uh, what I have to say has been said by other people, but I feel it's important. I feel like I want to say it also. It's just that, you know, uh, just personally, uh, I, I feel very inspired by Martin, and I have been for many years. Uh, I see the the depth, and, and like I said, people have said this. I'm repeating what other people have said, but you know the depth of of mentorship. Um, you know the desire to to write things that are um, that are true and stand the test of time, and to work on things that are relevant to South Africa. Uh, that's that's very important to me. Um, and so I, I guess I've just been, um, uh, Martin's uh, an inspiration for me and I, I hope to emulate him in my, in my career. I think we're gonna have to cut this. <laughs> um, yeah, besides anything else, you can say something. But you need to come and stand here with me. It's just that basically I'm, yeah, my, my strength is gonna give out, never mind anything else, yeah. So 12 years ago, 12 years ago? 2010, June 2010, so that's actually, yeah. Yeah. No, that's more like 13 years ago. <laughs> yeah, this is why I love the talking. So, yeah, about 13 years ago, David, did you know what it That's true. That's true. And the dean, I think it was Don Doss at the time. No, it was... Um, the Canadian. No, it wasn't uh, the Canadian. It was actually, there was an acting dean. The dean that... I dealt with was Mike Wormont, uh, who was okay, acting. That wasn't, that wasn't Mike, that wasn't Mike. Mike uh, Don called Lynn and me into the No, office. that was when they changed it from 
at indirectly. Yeah. Into the dean's office, and they and he basically said that you want to know how we would feel about having Martin done in their book. Mm -hmm. 